Hi guys and welcome back to the Red Coat History podcast and YouTube channel. Today is a continuation of my recent YouTube video I made documenting a tour of lesser known sites of the Anglo-Zulu War that I did with the KwaZulu-Natal Battlefield Guides Association of which I'm a, a member and I'm currently training to be a guide myself. In that video I showed a clip of my own presentation on the site of the Battle of Ntombe Drift. It's a battle that I've covered before on the show, but it's a fascinating one and it's one I'm continuously learning about. In this video I wanted to share with you the entire video of my talk. As an aside, if you're listening to the audio only version of this, then you may want to quickly visit my website redcoathistory.com to see a map and some photos of the site, of the location. I think that will help you to follow the narrative of the battle better. As I said, I'm currently training to be a guide, so speaking in front of a live audience like in this video, especially such a knowledgeable audience, is quite intimidating. All those guys are tour guides themselves. But you can be the judge as to how you think it went. So first, firstly, I just want to say before we begin, I'm, I'm here to learn rather than to teach. So I am a novice at this and please do feel free to jump in, add any thoughts, add any tips and also point out any mistakes, which inevitably there will be. So I want to talk today about the Battle of Ntombe Drift. Now this beautiful spot, it's hard to imagine it, but on the early morning of the 12th of March, 1879, this was actually the scene of a terrible British disaster. I think of it almost like a mini Zandwana in a way. You know, as you can see, you've got the Tafelberg Mountain there, absolutely frames the skyline beautifully. That was actually the home of a, a local Swazi warrior called Mbalini Wam Swati, which we're going to talk more about in a minute. The watercourse at the bottom here, that's the Ntombe River. And the drift going across is sometimes called Ntombe Drift, sometimes Myers Drift. So that can, that can vary depending on what accounts that you read. Now, I want to give you a little bit of background to the battle that was fought here before we get too into the, into the nitty gritty. Everyone here knows the basic background to the Anglo-Zulu War, but essentially after the Battle of Izandwana fought on the 22nd of January 1879, there was three British invasion columns. <clears throat> there was Lord Chelmsford Central Column, which after the Battle of Izandwana was forced to withdraw back to Rourke's Drift, was essentially out of the game, at least for, for now. You then had Colonel Pearson with the right flank or coastal column. When he heard what had happened at Izandwana, he was, he was at Eshowe, a mission station on, on that side of Natal. He then, he then dug in and they, they were then besieged at Eshowe. That just left the northern column under Colonel Evelyn Wood. Um, and they were based not too far from here, up towards Kambula side around there. They moved around a little bit, but they settled over at Kambula, where there was another battle, which I'm sure we'll talk about another day. The reason that's important is they were the only column that was still able to maneuver. They were the only column who could still take the war to the Zulus. The others were basically dead in the water at this point. And so, so their column, Evelyn Wood's column, was very, very important to the British war effort at this point. They, they couldn't afford to, to, to lose those men and to, to have those also stationary. They'd also just had a big, a big victory for them in that uh, Major Buller, who commanded the Frontier Light Horse, had helped to bring over about, I think it was about a thousand warriors under a man named Hamu, who was actually Etsuayo's brother. Uh, and that was a big coup for the British at a time where they didn't have many propaganda victories. So that was a big deal. So there was a lot going on in this part of Natal at that point. But it wasn't easy for Wood. His opponents were a group called the Abba Hulusi. Apologies if I'm mispronouncing that. <laughs> But they were under the command of a man named Manyan Yorba, who I believe his name means to sneak up. So you, you perhaps tell me if I'm wrong, does, does that make sense? Okay, great. So his name kind of gives away the sort of warfare, warfare that was being fought in this area, surprise attacks, raiding, that sort of thing. Manyan Yorba's right-hand man was actually not a Zulu at all. He was a Swazi. Um, he, he was a prince called Mbalini Wa Mswati, who I believe, if my history is right here, had made an attempt at the, at the Swazi crown, had failed, and had then come over and thrown in his lot with, thrown in his lot with Hetswayo. And that's why he was a Swazi, but he, he fought for the Zulus during the Anglo-Zulu War. Uh, he was 36 years old. There are pictures of him, actually. There's a photograph of him. Slim, handsome man. Doesn't, doesn't really look like a tough guy, but he was. You know, this was a man who was raised from a young age 
for warfare, for irregular warfare, small battles, raiding, that sort of thing. He was, a, he was not the sort of opponent you wanted to be fighting in, in guerrilla warfare. In fact, his nickname was the Hyena of the Pongola. I mean, that, that gives you a sense of what people thought about him. It was even said that as a child, this, this may not be true, but it was said that he was wrapped in the skin of a wild dog so that he would imbibe um, some of that dog's aggression. And it seems to have worked. So why would there be a battle here then? What was important about this spot? Well, you can still see the remains of an old wagon trail. And the wagon trail went from Derby, which is about 38 miles away, I believe, in that direction, down here, past the Tafelberg, this mountain, which was the stronghold of Mbalini Wamswati, and then down across the river up to, up to Lüneburg, up there. So, and the reason that's important is because of all the raiding that had been, happened, had been happening around here, five companies of the 80th Regiment, which later became the Staffordshires, had been moved here. They'd originally been in Transvaal. They'd been in South Africa for a while. They'd fought against uh, Sekukune in the first Sekukune campaign. So these were old Africa hands. And they'd been moved down here to try and protect this road and also to protect Lüneburg, where, as, as you will have read up at the, grave, at the cemetery there, uh, the local German farmers had basically lagered themselves up because of all the raiding. So that's why there was five companies of British troops here, under a man named Major Charles Tucker. A uh, very nice man from all accounts. Uh, it seems the soldiers loved him. So anyway, at the end of February, a convoy of 18 wagons was sent from Derby to come here. And it was an important convoy. There was uh, food, there was mealies, there was tinned food, there was 90,000 rounds of ammunition, and there was an entire rocket battery as part of that convoy. So it was an important convoy and one the British couldn't really afford to lose. But inexplicably, it was sent with no escort. And anyone who had written about this road had said, you can't send convoys down here with no escort. It's, it's a suicide mission. So Major Tucker, hearing this, sent out D Company under Captain Pearson to go find the wagons and escort them back, which is what he then did. He, he found them along this road, quite far away from here, started bringing them that back in. But it was terrible weather. It was raining very, very hard. It was miserable. The guys were having to push the wagons because they were up to their axles in mud. And so it wasn't going well. The men weren't happy, as you can imagine. So Major Tucker sends a message to Captain Anderson, hurry up, get your guys back here, hurry up. He meant hurry up with all the wagons. Captain Anderson, perhaps looking for an excuse, read the message as bring your men back, leave the wagons where they are. So that's what they did. They headed back to Lüneburg, left the wagons, strung out all the way along this road. And surprise, surprise, looters came down from the hills, started looting the wagons. By sheer coincidence at that time, the warriors of Hamu, who had recently uh, changed sides and was now fighting for the British, came along at the same time, chased them away, which gave the British a bit of, a bit of breathing space to actually do something here. So Major Tucker sent out, under Captain David Moriarty, who we've already spoken about, he sent out a company-sized detachment, I think it was about 106 men, to go and bring the wagons in. So that's what he did. He went out, it was still raining, it was miserable weather, but they started gathering all the wagons and they were able to bring them to just the other side of this river. But it was very, very heavy rain. Now they managed to make a small ferry uh, out of planks and barrels and they got two, they managed to get two of the wagons across. But then the rain got heavier, the river got higher, and they could no longer get the rest across, which meant the majority of the men, I think it was about 65, were now stuck on the north bank under Captain Moriarty. On the south bank, under a man named Lieutenant Lindop, uh, with his right-hand man, Sergeant uh, Booth, also of the 80th Regiment, were about 40 men on the south, on the south bank of the river there. So Moriarty was now stuck. He had all these wagons and he didn't really know what to do. So he decided to lager up, which was, you know, standard procedure. Everyone here knows what that means. But his lagering was very sloppy. So what he did, if you see the slope of this hill there, imagine a sort of V-shape, probably from more or less where this fence starts. I might be slightly off. Going up the hill with the apex of the inverted V, because it was like that shape, just below the brow of the hill there and then coming back down the slope to rest alongside the river. So you had the long edge of the inverted V along the river here. Now the wagons were very poorly spaced. As, as anyone who knows anything about Africana history knows, you know, you're meant to put the wagons tightly together, chain them up, and, uh, and that's how a lager works. But these had big gaps between them. Not only that, but he'd built the lager with the river in mind. And at that point when he built it, the river was very high. So, you know, no Zulu warrior would be able to come round 
the edge of the lager and come into the camp. But as the rain started to die off, the river level went down a little bit, meaning the whole bottom of the lager was now basically easy pickings. Anyone could infiltrate around the flanks of the wagons into, into, uh, into the compound there. So we had all these weaknesses. It was miserable. And then on the 11th, Major Tucker came out and he said to, he, so he came in person. He said to Captain Moriarty, he said, you need to get a move on. This was the 11th of March. He said, you need to get a move on. I don't care what your excuses are. Get the wagons back, get them in. Now he says, after the fact, whether this is true, he says that he commented on the lager, said it's no good, sort it out. And nothing was done. The lager was left as it was. Now, some people, some of the reading I've been doing says, you know, Moriarty and his men hadn't bothered lagering all the way down as they were bringing these wagons in. So they'd got a bit too blasé. They kind of took their safety for granted. They thought, ah, oh, the Zulus aren't going to do anything here. On top of that, there was another red flag. I mean, there's so many red flags here. If you're a British officer, surely you would have seen some of them. But one of the, one of the civilian wagon drivers who was with the convoy, because it wasn't just military, there were civilians, uh, both black and white civilians here. One of the wagon drivers spotted Mbellini in the compound, allegedly, selling vegetables. He was here unarmed, selling vegetables. Oh, come and get your veg. You know, as a way to, to have a little look around, do a little reconnaissance of what was happening. And that information was presumably ignored because nothing, nothing was done about it. Anyway, as Major Tucker, after delivering his message to hurry up, he headed back to Lunenburg and he took with him Lieutenants Johnson and Lindop, who had been the two uh, subalterns who had been here with Moriarty. In their place was a man who's going to be central to our story, Lieutenant Henry Harwood. So he, Lieutenant Harwood, he wanted to actually be on the north bank. He asked if he could share Moriarty's tent and Moriarty said, bugger off. Go back to the south bank. I'm all right over here. Thank you very much. So Harwood came back, took command of the 35, 40 or so men here on the south bank. Um, under him was Sergeant Anthony Booth, uh, who I think we've, we've mentioned, and we're going to talk a little bit more about in a minute. But to go back to Umbellini, who is, our, who is our adversary here, the British Army's adversary, he was a master of the surprise attack, and he would have been traveling by night, holding up during by day so that nobody could see him preparing for his attack when the moment was right. And the moment was right early in the morning of March the 12th. So imagine the scene here, it's very, very dark. On the south bank, you've got two wagons that have been brought over and a number of tents with about 40 men on this side of the river. On that side, you've got the other 16 wagons. And bear in mind, there was also a lot of cattle here too. So there would have been a lot of cattle. I don't know how many, but presumably a couple of hundred maybe in the middle of in the middle of the lager there. So there was a lot going on. About half past three or four o'clock in the morning, there was a gunshot, a single gunshot that woke up Sergeant Booth on this side of the river and Lieutenant Harwood. They came out to investigate. Now to this day, we still don't know what it was, but we can only presume it was a negligent discharge by a careless warrior as he was sort of sneaking closer to the compound here. Booth came out and he called across the river to see what was happening. At first, he didn't get any response. Eventually, a sentry came out and said, no, no, everything's fine. I've spoken with Captain Moriarty. He says the men should get dressed, but go back to their tents. So yet another red flag was being ignored here. I mean, you know, if that isn't enough to make you, you know, get everybody out of their tents and ready for action, I don't know what is. But Sergeant Booth, he was a, he was a tough, experienced NCO. He'd been in the army a number of years. You see pictures of him. He looks like a real bulldog, you know, with the manly moustache and the centre part in. You want him on your side in a barroom brawl, let's, let's put it that way. And he decides, I'm not going to go back to sleep. I'm going to go and do some work. So he gets up and he goes to the commissary tent and starts doing some work, chatting with one of his colleagues. While he's there, at about half past four in the morning, he hears a call. Sergeant Johnson, Sergeant Johnson, call out the guard. He comes running out of the tent. And this is the time of day the Zulus called, I think it's the, uh, not the horns of the bull. Is it the horns of the morning? I've got it in my notes, I can check, which is where you can just make out the horns of the bull against the, the grey sky. So at that time of day, it was a classic Zulu time to attack because not only um, was it good for you, you know, to, to sneak up on your opponent, but also they're at a very low ebb physically and mentally at that time of day. So it was perfect time to attack. There was fog. And as you can see, the, with the apex of the lager at the top of that hill, there's a lot of dead ground for them to gather on the other side. I mean, there was two sentries they, Moriarty put out two sentries, one on the south bank, one on the north bank, which just clearly isn't enough, especially given the amount of dead ground around the north side there. 
So anyway, as, as Sergeant Booth comes out, he looks to his horror and he sees what they said at the time was four to 5,000 Zulus. Now we know now that's probably nonsense and it was actually closer to 800 to 1,000 Zulu warriors from mainly from the Abakulusi had gathered around. They raised their muskets, they fired a volley, they raised their assegais and they ran inside. And they started just assegaiing the soldiers, many of whom were still in bed. A lot of them were naked. They came out with their rifles naked they got slotted quite quickly. So there was no chance of organizing a, a, a good defense. You know, the, any chance of doing that had been lost when they didn't turn out the guard properly after the first rifle shot had been heard like an hour previously. So there was confusion. The men were naked. They were trying to do their best to fight. The cattle were stampeding. I mean, you can only imagine, you know, half past four, five o'clock in the morning, cattle stampeding. There's, gun fight, there's, there's, gun, there's a gun battle raging, there's men being assegaied. It's, it's a crazy scene. We can barely, barely appreciate it now, looking across a, at such a nice, wonderful spot. Now, one of the first people to be killed was our old friend, Captain David Moriarty. He was in a tent, inexplicably, it's one of my favorite words, that had been pitched just outside the lager. I mean, why he would pitch his tent outside the lager, who knows? Um, I do know he was sharing his tent with Surgeon Cobbin at the time. The two of them had decided they wanted a little bit of privacy outside the lager. And so when, when the Zulus attacked, they were, they were amongst the first to get killed. Now there's a number of different stories, well, two that I found about Moriarty. The most famous story is that he emerged from his tent, pulled his revolver, shot three Zulus who were allegedly sons of Manyanyoba, uh, although I've subsequently read that probably wasn't the case. I think one may have been the son of Chief uh, Sihayo, who most of you will know from Sihayo's Kral, uh, which was the first, the first engagement that the Central Column fought during the war. But anyway, he comes out, shoots three Zulus allegedly, shouts, uh, death fire away boys, death or glory, or something along those lines, gets shot. As he stumbles off, someone stabs him, he's dead. Now the second story I read, by a, which was told by a man named Private Hogan, was that nothing of the sort happened. He came out and he was the first to get killed, didn't say anything, and he was dead almost immediately. I don't know which is true, I wasn't there, I just know which probably sounds more realistic. You know, if you're outside the lager, the chances of you having time to wander out, shoot a, shoot a few Zulus and, and cheer on your lads is probably quite small. So while all that was happening on the North Bank, here on the South Bank, Sergeant Booth and Lieutenant Harwood started to organize their men here. There was two wagons just over where the ferry was, which was kind of diagonally over that way, just by the river there. The two wagons were there. They got their men under those wagons and they started firing volleys into the flanks of the Zulu attackers. As it became clear that the battle on that side was lost, men tried to come down and swim across the river to you know, the relative safety of the South Bank. As they did so, the, the men here offered covering fire, trying to protect them as they came across. But the river was fast, it was seven knots. I mean, I'm not a nautical man, I don't even know what that means, but you know, according to the literature I've read, that's pretty fast for a river to be flowing. And it was deep, and not many of these men were strong swimmers. So out of all the men trying to escape, I believe only 12, including civilians, were able to get across the river. As they came across, two to 300 Zulus decided, well, we're not gonna let these guys get away and they started crossing after them. Now, as we know, individually, Zulus at the time weren't strong swimmers, but what they did do, and uh, I've, I've not read this, but I presume what happened is they would have joined arms and en masse crossed the river as a group of two or 300 to get across. They emerged across the river. It's a narrow river, as you can see. It would have been wider at the time because it would have been in full flow, but they got across the river and a hand-to-hand -hand battle ensued just here down by the wagons. Um, at that point, Lieutenant Harwood felt that he had lost control of the situation. And he felt the only way he could save it was to take a horse, not even his horse, and ride back to Lunenburg, alert Major Tucker, and bring them back here to try and save the day. Now, maybe we can talk in a minute about whether that was the right thing to do or not. But that's what he did. He said he couldn't rally the men and he took his horse and escaped. That left Sergeant Booth, along with a man named Lance Corporal Burgess, to try and extract the survivors. So what they did, again, I haven't found exact proof of this, but my assumption, based on the knowledge of tactics of the time, is they would have formed some sort of rally square, like a, a received cavalry square. But, it, you know, you see pictures of Napoleonic Wars in a big square. 
you know, for when cavalry attacks so that they can't outflank you and get round the back and roll you up. So I'm assuming that they formed a rally square, which is essentially a, an ad hoc received cavalry square where they essentially would have just bunched together so that the Zulus couldn't outflank them and kill them all. They started a fighting retreat all the way across this broken ground and they got as far as a place, an abandoned farmhouse called Rabe Farm, R-A-B-E. Now I've read that's now the site of a church, but I'm not sure which one. I read they'd traveled about three kilometers, in which case that rules out this church here. So if anyone knows the church, uh, do you know the church, sir? Oh, there's not? No. Ah. I'll show you the place on the website. Oh, that would be fantastic. Yeah, thank you. Is it like an abandoned building still? Uh, no, not really buildings, but still a couple of stones lying around. Brilliant. Okay, well, yeah, that would be wonderful if you could show us on the way back. So they retreat to there where, they, where they're able to hold up and they're able to hold off, you know, these continued Zulu attacks against them. While that's happening, Lieutenant Harwood, who's escaped now to Lunenburg, goes up to Fort Clary, where we've just been, burst into Major Tucker's tent, and says the men are all slaughtered and the camp is lost, at which case he seems to have fainted across, uh, across Major Tucker's bed. Tucker, thinking fast, gathers all the available men that he can who are, who are on horseback, mainly the officers and anyone else who's got a horse available. He tells the rest of the infantry to follow behind him and he comes running, running down towards the battlefield. As he approaches, the Zulus break off their attack against Rab Rabbe Farm and they withdraw, taking with them all of the cattle all of the ammunition, basically anything worthwhile in that column was stripped and taken away. Only 25 Zulu bodies were found afterwards, which I think is tantamount to how successful their, their tactics had been. They'd taken the British completely by surprise. And yes, it was Zulu procedure to try and take the dead with them, so there may have been more. But I think the fact that only 25 bodies were found afterwards speaks, speaks volumes for the success of their raid. Now, when Major Tucker arrived, and I'm going to read a quote here, he, he later wrote that it was a fearful and horrible sight that presented itself. Our men were laying about all over the place, some naked, all the bodies full of assegai wounds, and nearly all were disemboweled. Now, I wanted to talk about that because in, in British and European culture, we talk of disemboweling as being this horrific act that you would only do to someone who you really hated and detested. But Zulu culture wasn't necessarily the same as that. For example, from my, from my research, and I would love if anyone you know, wants to jump in as well, there was two reasons bodies would be stabbed multiple times or disemboweled. One is called kaka, and I believe that is you would slit open the stomach of an enemy to allow his soul to escape. And I think of this as almost like an early form of dealing with PTSD. Now, I could be wrong, but the, the theory is that if a Zulu warrior kills you and he doesn't allow your soul to escape, your spirit will come back and haunt him. Now, to me, that's, that's quite a good comparison, surely, to sort of PTSD. And, you know, by allowing the spirit to escape, you're kind of stopping those dreams, those nightmares that might happen that you may interpret as the spirit coming back to haunt you. So I find that really, really interesting. The other thing that Zulu warriors would do was called homula, which is where multiple warriors would stab uh, the body of a dead enemy, a brave enemy, so that they could um, share in some of the honors of killing such a brave soldier. So what we think of as brutalizing the dead actually doesn't seem to have been anything of the sort, which I find really interesting. Now, at the start of the talk, I said this was a mini Zandwana, and in many ways it was. Now, I've read different figures. I think on the memorial it says 61 members of the 80th were killed, although I could be wrong. But up at Moriarty's grave, it said 65. So I've read different numbers in different sources. But essentially, 60% of the company-sized detachment that was here was killed, plus nearly all of the civilians as well. Surgeon Cobbin, whose grave we saw, was killed, and 17 wagoneers. Now, as horrific as that is, I can't help but think, wow, only a 60% casualty rate, given what happened. I mean, there's battles that are much less disastrous. I'm thinking of Albuera, where the British suffered sort of, you know, in the range of 60% casualty rates. So I think that speaks volumes about Sergeant Booth and Lance Corporal Burgess and their ability to withdraw men across broken ground under constant attack. I mean, to extract 40 survivors in that situation is, is absolutely outstanding soldiering. I think you'll agree. So anyway, when Major Tucker came here and the battlefield was cleared, Moriarty and Cobbin were taken up and buried, as we have saw. The rest of the men were buried in that mass grave there. So that's actually the site of a mass grave, that the second um, gated area that we see here. 
This memorial, I think I've got this the right way round, this memorial was actually built in 1911 by officers of the 2nd South Staffordshire Regiments, which was a descendant unit of the 80th, when they were based at Pretoria in 1911. So that's, that's what these two, um, these two gated areas rep represent. Now, as you can see, sometimes these graves are damaged. I think this actually happened. I got sent these photos about 18 months ago by a friend who farms over here. It's hard to say exactly what the reasons are. Some people say it's because they believe bodies are buried with their valuables and they might be able to find something valuable. I've heard other people say that they're looking for bones for Muti. And thirdly, it could just be simply political, you know, I hate these bloody colonialists. I don't want their, their graves, you know, in this area. Could be that, could be any of those, could be all three. I don't know. I'm, I'm happy to take advice on that. But before we wrap up, I just want to reflect on some of the central characters who were, who were so important in this battle. And I think firstly, we have to raise a hat to Mbalini Wamswati. I mean, you know, his success really was extraordinary. But it also had a drawback for him and for the Abu Khulusi because it really focused the mind of Colonel Evelyn Wood and, uh, and the Northern Column because they knew they had to do something about these guys. And that indirectly led to the attack on Khabane, which happened uh, a little bit later in March. Again was a disaster, but did set up the victory at Kambula the following day. So this had real knock-on effects. Now, Umbalini himself was wounded at Khabane, but he survived and he continued raiding in this area with his sort of daring guerrilla raids. Now, this clashes a little bit with what Pat said earlier, so I'm happy to, to bow to Pat's superior knowledge on this. But according to the sources I read, on the 5th of April, his look ran out, when a patrol of the 80th under a man named Captain Pryor cornered him and some of his men, and it was actually a Zulu auxiliary on the side of the British who shot Mbalini in the shoulder. He managed to live a few more days, but eventually the hyena of the Pongola, a brave and worthy enemy of the British, finally died. Now, another man I want to talk about is Lieutenant Henry Harwood. Initially, I think we can all agree, he did well. You know, he was, he was alert to the dangers quite quickly, much, more, much quicker than Captain Moriarty on the North Bank. He helped to organise the men. He started pumping volleys into the Zulus on the other side. But where it all falls apart is that he ran away and he left his men in the lurch. Not exactly a, a perfect example of Victorian spirit of self-sacrifice. In fact, you could argue quite the opposite. Now, his argument was, you know, he could do it quicker. He could get on a horse and call, you know, call the rest of the men here, which is probably true. But for me, where his story falls apart is collapsing in Major Tucker's tent. I sort of feel that if you're going to run to get help, you need to then lead the help back here and sort of be at the forefront of the battle. Otherwise, it doesn't really look good for you. So, so, so you know, there's, a, there's a, a conversation to be had around what should have happened to him. Initially, nothing happened to him, but then he was court-martialed and in February 1880 was arrested in England, he'd already returned home, brought back to South Africa for court-martial for misbehaving before the enemy. He was found not guilty, interestingly, but this really angered Sir Garnet Wolseley. Now, as we all know, Sir Garnet Wolseley didn't mince his words. He had very few nice words to say about anybody, to be fair. And he, he wrote of this, there's no justification for an officer to desert his men. An officer should share the fortunes of his men for good or ill. Now, he was so angry about this that him and uh, I think it was the Duke of Cambridge or whoever was the head of the army at the time, decided to have this read out to every regiment in the British Army with their, with their general orders in the morning. And so every regiment heard this story. They knew exactly who it was about. And that meant Lieutenant Harwood had no choice but to resign his commission, which he did. I haven't been able to find out what happened to him after leaving the army, but I do know he died in 1897 and left a thousand pounds in his will. The final man I want to talk about today, and don't worry, I know it's hot, we are going to wrap up soon, is Sergeant Anthony Booth. Now, this really was a man amongst men. He was immediately promoted to colour sergeant. He was then recommended for the Victoria Cross. There was a bit of a gap, but eventually he was recommended. And his was the second Victoria Cross from the 80th Regiment of Foot during the Anglo-Zulu War. Anyone know the first? Private Wassell. Well done, sir. <laughs> Private Wassell, yeah. Can you tell us what he, what he won it for? Um, saving... Um Saving a troop at the uh, Fugitive Drift. Correct. Private Westwood, I believe. Private Westwood. Yeah. Was he also the 80th Westwood? Okay. So anyway, he was given his Victoria Cross from the Queen at Windsor in 1880. So you can see, you know, Harwood sort of going one way, Booth going the other there. 
He loved the army, he stayed in, he finally left the army in 1898. Now, just as a final epilogue to our story, five companies, I think it was the same five, but I, I would have to double check that, of the 80th Regiment, were present at the battle of the slaughter of Alundi, whatever you want to call it. So they finally had their revenge for what had happened to their colleagues here at Ntombe Drift. But that's a story for another day. And that's the end. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. So there we go. As an aside, it was pointed out to me by two members of the audience that the man who killed Umbellini was in fact a local German settler called Filter, who was later himself killed by the Zulus. There's a memorial in his honour very close to Ntombe that was in my last video. Anyway, that's all for today. If you enjoyed this, then please don't forget to subscribe and share it with other fellow military history geeks. You can also join my mailing list over at redcoathistory.com newsletter. Until next time, take care, lager your wagons properly, post more than two centuries when deep in enemy territory, and for the love of God, do not pitch your tent outside the lager. All right, guys, take care.